So the programmable web. There are lots of websites. Everyone knows this. Um, the interesting thing is that everybody's feeding content. We all know about RSS feeds. I'm sure we all subscribe to a number of different RSS feeds using hopefully Google Reader, but really any re uh, reading program that you'd like to use. It's a great way to keep up on changes to websites, the latest news. The next step after simple RSS feeds, um, you know, very boring text feeds, is actually dynamic content. Interesting applications. As I'm sure you guys know, a gadget is just a container or a view to uh, some content on a web page. And in general, anything that works on a web page will work really, really comfortably in a gadget. There are lots of containers. There are lots of these sites which will host the gadgets. Um, with Google Gadgets, you can put a gadget on any web page that will take an iframe or an embed tag. Um, so they're popping up all over the place. Google Maps is a container. Uh, you can run maplets on it, which is a type of gadget containing a map. iGoogle, the personalized Google homepage, you can put your own gadgets on, and so on. And as we've touched on, it's not just RSS feeds. It's not just static HTML pages. It can be dynamic content as well. So you can have movies. You can have interactive maps. Um, you can have talk gadgets, talk clients. This should be pretty obvious. As time goes on, the number of gadgets that are building goes up because more and more people are developing them. In fact, we've got about 20,000 gadgets um, built so far, just over. And that's a lot of gadgets. That's a lot of great content out there. But at the moment, it's kind of restricted to one place, which is iGoogle and the places which can also embed it. The animation on this is a little strange, sorry. Here we go. So there are over 100,000 sites which, will, which are currently taking Google gadgets. That's a lot of sites. Obviously, some of these sites only have one or two gadgets. Others will have thousands. What that means is we're serving billions of these gadgets every week. That's a lot of page views, no matter how you look at it. Um, there's obviously some trends uh, which are quite interesting to look at. The most interesting of which is the fact that 63 gadgets, I'm going to have to read my translation here so I get it definitely right, although you guys can probably read it better than I can. 63 gadgets with more than 1 million users. So. You'd expect that to be things like per day. Well, uh, no, 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 it's not page views, it's users. So 63 uh, gadgets with more than, more than 1 million users. Um, typically, things like Gmail are going to be very useful for someone who's got a Google per, uh, home page. They've probably got a Gmail account as well, so it makes sense that that would be pretty high. Google News, weather, and so on. They're very commonly used gadgets. It becomes a little more interesting when you get away from the core ones. So we've got 483 gadgets with more than 100,000 users. These are anything from the spider, which will crawl over your web page, to a uh, dictionary, to card games. There's a number of different things. What I think is the most interesting part, though, is the long tail. And this is the idea that 50% of all gadget traffic comes from outside the top 125 gadgets. So there are 125 gadgets that are very, very popular, but the rest are actually responsible for most of or for half of the traffic. So it is that niche. Those things that you build that you don't think many people will pick up on, maybe they won't, but they're actually individually driving a lot of this traffic. So what we're seeing people do with gadgets, not even social gadgets necessarily, but gadgets in general, is build lots of them. So companies will build 15 gadgets um, that all serve a different purpose, their customers will come along and take the three or four that are relevant to them. And it's that way. It's giving users the choice. It's giving them the range of gadgets that can serve their needs and making sure that they have content that's relevant to them that is where the success comes in. This slide they make me put in, I don't approve of it. The web's evolving. So what are we doing to help the open web? Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. You guys can read. You may have heard of some of them. Um, I'll dip into some of them in a little more detail. But we've got a lot going on. We've got some great uh, development teams. We've got some great engineers building some great products. And they're building them fast. They're very, very agile. Probably uh, the most well-known uh, thing that we work on is KML, I mean, other than search. And KML is the language behind Maps and Earth. 
It's a little bit like HTML. As, well, as you can see, it's a markup language. The ML is the giveaway. Um, it's basically a way to structure information. So if you look at the source of a web page, you might see a title tag. If you look at the source of an Earth file, you'll see a coordinate tag instead of a title or a description. And that will basically tell you, you know, the coordinate is where the point should be located. KML is um, really good. I've used it a lot, and it's becoming adopted as an industry standard um, because it just it makes sense. The way it's structured is easy to parse and interpret. We've got SketchUp. Um, this allows you to build 3D models, converts them again to KML and text, and allows you to import them into Google Earth. It's a very, very easy way uh, to build 3D models. You can wrap textures around. Uh, you can build models from photos. Um, and you can import files from pretty much any other 3D rendering package. So it's, it's a really useful tool that allows 3D people or 3D authors, 3D artists, uh, to download a tool for free, build stuff, get going. Mashups and the value of mashups. Does anyone here not know what a mashup is? One person, two. OK, a few. So a mashup is the idea of taking two technologies that are very different and literally mashing them together. So if you look, for example, at some voting data, the way people vote in an election, and a map, both of those are kind of standalone. And perhaps the voting data is very boring to read. But when you put it on top of a map, and you can actually visualize that information, it becomes more useful than just having a map and having some voting data. It's actually more beneficial to users, because they can look at something very quickly and see the ease. We've seen scientists using Google Earth, for example, to prototype and mock up uh, research data. Because it's not going to be the most accurate representation, but it allows them very quickly to see if there are anomalies within the data. So mashing this data together, putting things together very easily, very quickly, actually gives you great strength and great power. We've got a lot of tools out there that we want you to take advantage of. Google Gears. How many people have heard of Google Gears? A few. OK, so you can all read. Google Gears essentially allows you to take online uh, web applications and take them offline. I was trying to uh, show an example earlier of what this might be. And I described email. So imagine you're using a web application, uh, to, you know, Firefox, to read your mail. When you go offline, when you lose your internet connection, or when you're here today and the internet connection is a little bit slow, it can be very difficult um, to get your mail. So you're offline, you're in trouble. Google Gears will take a local copy. It basically uses a database to take uh, local information, store it locally. And it means that you can read your email, reply to it. Next time you connect online, it will synchronize, send those emails, download new ones. Someone turned around and said, well, isn't that just Outlook? And yeah, OK, it kind of is. But so mail is a bad example. But the idea is applications are going going online more and more. We're going to see basically the majority of our work run through a browser. So it means that if we don't have an inter internet connection, we're going to be in trouble. So it's really important to be able to synchronize this, store it offline, not worry too much about not having that internet connection. There's another slide here that goes into a little more detail, but I suspect I've covered it. So we'll skip over it. What's the most important thing about um, Google, about our technology, about our tools that we make available? They've got to be fast. They've got to be open. They've got to be easy. I hope I got that right. Um, the most important thing about fast is that you don't want your users to come to your website and wait for something to load. And it's still loading. And OK, it's there. That's not fun for anyone. We see it with Flash a lot. You'll access a Flash movie. The page will load like that. And then you'll have the little loading bar. Well, the Flash movie loads. And that's a frustrating experience. No one enjoys it. So it's really important that the tools we let you use respond quickly. It's important that they're open, that anyone can use them, and that they use a common framework. Without that, they become a closed system. They don't really get good adoption. And most important it's, uh, is that they're easy. They're easy to understand, they're easy to use, and they're well documented. Um, Rasmus Ladorf, who wrote PHP, I went to one of his conferences a few years ago. And he said that PHP was good because it was well documented. It could be the most powerful language in the world, but if every function wasn't described effectively, if you didn't understand what every parameter did, it was pointless having it because people couldn't use it. It's the same with us. We pride ourselves on having really well documented, easy to understand code with good examples. 
Which brings us to open social. So why open social? Um, everyone probably has heard of Facebook or MySpace or any number of other social networking sites. The problem these guys have is that they want their applications. We see it with Facebook. They want applications. They've got a great system. But it means that you have to learn a new programming language in order to be able to build a Facebook application. And once you've built that application, it's stuck on Facebook. It means that if you want to take it to another site, you've got to download it, change the code a little bit maybe, and then push it to another site. And suddenly, you're maintaining multiple code bases for a single project. And as an engineer myself, I can tell you that's not fun. I'm sure you guys all know the same, especially when the changes are tiny. It's like trying to program in four languages on a single page, on a web page. It just gets confusing. You don't know where you are. The idea behind open social is that, as I'm sure you know by now, you write this content once, and you can deploy it to any of the sites that you want to support it. Now, that doesn't mean that every site is going to be suitable. There are obviously going to be business sites, business containers, and there are going to be more social containers. So LinkedIn, for example, in the UK is a very popular business networking site. We exchange our details, we put our jobs, and it means that if you move jobs, someone can still get in contact with you. You compare that to Friendster or Facebook, where it's a lot more fun, and you're kind of throwing sheep at each other and poking each other. One application isn't necessarily going to work well across both. But there are lots of common types of websites. So there are lots of sites like LinkedIn, where a business application is going to be effective. There are lots of sites like Facebook, where a social application is going to be effective. So even though you may not be able to deploy to every site, it's solving the problem of identifying groups of users on sites that are appropriate. This is what I've just told you. Sorry, one slide behind. Um, we have a number of users signed up. I realize these guys aren't particularly relevant to the Russian market. Um, but we are working hard to sign up Russian containers as we speak. We've got a team of people who are communicating with them, or with containers all over the world, sites all over the world, to get them to host open social applications. And there's no reason why they can't uh, run in parallel. They can develop their own programming language. Bebo have just done this. They've reverse engineered Facebook's programming language. Um, and they're also supporting open social. And that's actually good, because it opens their uh, base up, their application base up, to multiple sources of applications. It's good for their users, and it's good for everyone. 